Hi, my name is uh, Matteo Maravita and I'm responsible of the Asia Pac AI Competence Center. Today I'm going to introduce you to some key concepts and tips you need to take care of when starting a new design of a machine learning project. Here is uh, the agenda of the topics we are going to cover. To keep the video duration reasonable, we split it in a series of uh, two videos. In the first one, we will introduce some key concepts of uh, machine learning. And we will start our design journey with data collection, data inspection and data cleaning. In the second one, we will focus more on the features that are extremely important for any kind of machine learning project. Then we will see how to evaluate the performance of the model that we have built. Finally, we will have some additional information that may be useful for you in the future. Let's start with some machine learning key concepts. Recently, mass media are talking a lot of artificial intelligence, referring to it as one of the most recent and advanced technologies. Actually, AI is a concept that has been conceived back in the 50s of last century and has a very wide meaning. It refers to any technique that enables a computer to mimic the human behavior. You can understand how this concept is quite general and it refers to many different areas of solutions and research. In this video, we will focus on a subset of AI called machine learning, introduced in the 80s of last century. We will introduce a keyword that you will often hear in this video, that is data. In fact, machine learning refers to any algorithm and methodology that use data and learn from data to improve over time. We will come back later to this very important concept. Then there is another subset of machine learning that is called deep learning that is the most complex and advanced algorithm. Uh, why? Because uh, not only it uh, learns from the data, but also as a, a structure that uh, mimics uh, the uh, neural network of the human brain. When we deal with machine learning projects, at first we need to change completely our approach to problem solving. In fact, with standard programming technique, we use a so-called a priori approach. In our brain, when we think of a problem, basically we already picture and consequently design the algorithm that we think that will solve the problem. Thus, we are already uh, writing the solution from the real beginning. While in machine learning, we use an empirical approach. We start from collecting data from observations of the system, both input data and desired output data, and we derive the algorithm that will best fit the data and observations collected. Obviously, we don't start from a blank sheet, but we select a few machine learning models available and we try to find the parameters that will give the best performance. In other words, we need a completely new mindset. Whenever we use machine learning or deep learning on embedded platforms, 
we needed to follow five key steps in the design process. At first, we needed to collect the data from our system and to save them in some data logs. The second step is to clean the data and eventually to make some pre-processing on them. We need also to add the labels to them in case of a supervised model. Now we have the so-called data set. In the third step, we start from the data set and we use it to train the machine learning model or we say also to fit it. In the fourth step, it depends if we are running on a PC or on an embedded platform. On a PC, we can run simply the Python libraries available for AI solutions. While on embedded platforms, we need to convert from these libraries to C code for microcontrollers like the STM32 or to register settings uh, for uh, hardware solutions like the machine learning core present in the STMEMS. The final step is to validate the machine learning model created on a real-time application. Talking about uh, traditional machine learning uh, solutions, uh, we have uh, a wide variety of models that can be used, each uh, with uh, some uh, pros and cons. We will focus uh, our attention from now on on one of them uh, called uh, Decision Tree, for two main reasons. The first reason uh, is that it is uh, very simple to understand uh, and uh, will help us to go through all the key steps uh, of uh, a machine learning model design. The second reason is that it is the one used in the hardware engine present in our latest family of motion maps, called Machine Learning Core. Let's jump into one example that is often used in the machine learning world, the real estate agency example. We needed to define at first three key points, the problem, the features or the input uh, to my system, to my algorithm, and uh, the desired output. The problem is uh, to understand if the customer will buy or not buy an house. The features uh, or inputs uh, are a number of information uh, that we think that are relevant to solve uh, this uh, problem like the cost of the house, the number of the rooms, the distance from the station, and so on. The desired output is to understand if the customer will buy or not buy. So in this case, we are talking about a binary classification problem. You see on the right a decision tree a model that uh, I built uh, for the sake of explanation for you in order to solve this issue. So let's go uh, through it. At first uh, you can see that uh, one of the features, uh, the customer salary, is checked with uh, a certain threshold, 100k dollar per year. If uh, uh, the condition is true or false, uh, uh, we will move on the uh, right side or left side of the decision tree. Then we move to another, what we call a decision node, where we are going to check another future. And then again, we will have another threshold. And then we will proceed until we reach what we call a final leaf, is where we take the decision, buy or not to buy. You can see in this example all the key elements of the decision tree. That are the decision node, the futures, the thresholds, and the final leaves. But you can tell me, okay, I'm solving this kind of problem with a kind of if-then-else structure. So it doesn't sound so much like an AI model. Where is the trick? Actually, uh, what is important is not the decision tree structure itself, 
but is uh, how I built it. Here, as I said, uh, I built it uh, for this example, uh, um, thinking uh, a priori what uh, can be a reasonable future and in which order I will check the different futures and with uh, some uh, thresholds that I think uh, that are reasonable. We will see later that uh, actually all these things will be learned from the data set. In fact, I built a decision tree model starting from a data set of a real estate agency of houses, for example, in Tokyo, where I live. And starting from this data, learning from the data, I decide which futures are more relevant to my problem, in which decision node I will use them, which are the thresholds that I will use, and which are the results of the leaf nodes. If I change, for example, my data set from Tokyo to the Japanese countryside, or to other cities in the world, like Milano, Paris, Sydney, whatever, you can understand well that I may need to change uh, all the futures and the thresholds and so on in order to best fit the reality of each location. So basically, with machine learning, I will try to fit my data set and to find all the uh, futures, thresholds and so on that will uh, uh, give me the best performance. So we have seen the five key steps of a machine learning model design. We may need a dedicated tool for each of them. In case of STMEMS MLC solution, we have a dedicated tool called Unico GUI that is helping us to collect the data to label them, to train the model, and also to validate it. For the training phase, it is also possible to use external tools like MATLAB, Weka, Python libraries, and so on. Let's start from the data collection. We need at first to select the right hardware platform or evaluation board with the right sensors for my use case. ST is providing a wide variety of evaluation boards and in this case we will focus on the ones that are mounting the motion maps with the machine learning core function. Also we need a software tool in order to log the data coming from the sensors. In case of ST, we are offering a tool called Algo Builder Suite uh, in order to copy it. When collecting the logs for my dataset, I needed to decide at the very beginning a few key points. The first one is the definition of the classes for my problem since that we are talking about a classifier model. The classes are basically the desired output of my machine learning model. In this case, I have a couple of examples of a motor vibration problem or a human activity recognition problem. The second point is the selection of the most appropriate sensor uh, for my problem. I may decide to use only the accelerometer or I may need to use also a gyroscope or other sensors like a pressure sensor, magnetometer and so on. The third point to decide at the very beginning is the settings of this sensor. For example, for motion MEMS, I need to decide the output data rate and the full scale. 
In fact, if I'm going to change later one of these settings, I may need to restart all the process from the beginning and I want to avoid it. When collecting the data, I need to take care also of other important factors. The first one is data consistency. For example, if I'm collecting the data log in my lab, I need to make sure that the conditions and the environment is similar to my application use case, and eventually integrate the data later with other acquisitions taken in the real world application. The second point is to have a so-called balanced data set. Since we are talking about a classifier, I need to make sure that each class has a similar amount of sample. In fact, if I have one class with less samples than others, this class may be later not well recognized and the model may be polarized versus the other classes. The third point is the data log format. Sometimes it's uh, easy to forget about it uh, or uh, when dealing with a large amount of data to mix uh, data with uh, different uh, formats. This is why, for example, in ST, in all, all recent uh, demos, uh, we are uh, uh, using a predefined data format called High Speed Data Log. Once all data are collected, we can now move to the machine learning model design. After applying some filtering or pre-processing to the raw data coming from the sensor, we can calculate and select the features that represent the inputs to my machine learning model. This is where there is a major difference between the machine learning and the deep learning approach. In fact, while in machine learning the selection of the features is extremely important, in deep learning we work usually with raw data and the features are automatically calculated and selected by the neural network itself. Here we can see some typical examples of features used for motion maps like peak-to-peak -peak value, variance, mean and so on. We will come back later to this important aspect. Once the features are calculated, the decision tree can be built. In a similar way to the example we have seen before with the real estate agency. In fact, we can see here that we are just changing the name of the features and the binary outputs with the ones used for motion maps. It's very important to remember that usually in machine learning uh, we split the overall data set in the so-called uh, training data set and the test data set. In fact, we are using only a part of the overall data set to train the model, usually 80% in case of small, medium size data sets and we will use the remaining part, uh, the test data set, in order to evaluate the performance of the model built. This is done in order not to cheat. In fact, if I'm using uh, to evaluate the performance the same data that I used to train the model, basically uh, I cannot make sure that the model uh, will perform well also with uh, data slightly different. Basically, I'm checking if the machine learning model is able to generalize enough. A very important operation is the data inspection. In order to identify any possible errors in the data set, poor quality data, or the so-called outliers. I may check at first in the time domain if I can see any pattern to recognize different classes or if any future, like the peak-to-peak, -peak, the variance and so on, seems to be more informative. 
Another option is to analyze the data in the frequency domain. In fact, sometimes we can observe that some classes have a very peculiar frequency footprint. Like in this example, where we can recognize easily the walking class from the jogging or running class just looking at the FFT of the raw data coming from the accelerometer. One operation that is often neglected or to which AI beginners don't pay so much attention is the process of data cleaning. In fact, since we have said that the machine learning model is learning from the data, any kind of error or poor quality data will have a drastic impact on the performance of the model built. In machine learning world, AI engineers usually refer to it with the famous sentence garbage in, garbage out. For example, in this real use case, where we wanted to detect the different operation of a power drill, whether it's tightening or untightening a screw, you can see in the logs that are present also data of a non-drilling condition. We should put this data in a different dummy class, like idle or other. Usually, the labeling process uh, cannot be done uh, automatically very easily, and uh, we need uh, to do it uh, manually. The last point that needed to be decided is uh, the selection of the most appropriate window size. In fact, we need to make sure, after a data analysis and visualization, that uh, all the signal of interest is uh, properly captured. Obviously, there is uh, a trade-off versus uh, the response time needed in the application.